Uh, our speaker is someone I, I really, really was hoping we could get, and uh, it took a while, not because of him, but because of our own scheduling. And uh, I'm just delighted to introduce you to uh, uh, Brian Loritz. He's uh, the lead pastor at Fellowship Memphis Church. Uh, it's a multicultural church uh, ministering to the uh, urban community of Memphis, Tennessee. He uh, has a master's and is working on a PhD. He's also a trustee at a nice little school uh, up in the L.A. area called Biola, or Biola, or how do you say that, Brian? Anyway, but Brian is a, is a good brother and uh, someone, again, we've wanted to get here. And Brian, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for working us into your schedule. And uh, let's welcome him in the name of Christ. Well, Westmont, what a joy it is to be with you all uh, this morning. Uh, I tell you, that worship was awesome. Awesome. Y'all got a little bit of soul to you. <laughs> Love it. Some of y'all was clapping kind of offbeat, but hey, that's okay. That's okay. We worship in spirit and in truth. Anyways, what a complete, absolute joy it is to be with you. Uh, I see they've got, they put a black man on the clock, which is like kryptonite, but um, so we've got to hurry up and get with it. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, feel free to meet me in Matthew chapter 25 as you're turning there. Uh, just really want to just tell you how excited I, I am again to be here. I bring you greetings from Memphis, Tennessee, where uh, I shared with a few of the students yesterday. Uh, we planted a church uh, nine years ago. Um, we came to Memphis because we asked the Lord to send us to the most racially divided uh, city along black and white lines uh, in the United States using the 2000 census as our guide. It was Memphis, Tennessee. I could spend a lot of time talking to you about the racial strife that continues there. To this day, of course, that's the city that assassinated Dr. King. Uh, around the corner from there is Nathan Bedford Forest Park, which is a park they have in honor to the founder of the KKK. Uh, it's, um, he's buried there. Uh, there's Auction Street right downtown. That's where they used to auction the slaves. If you come to Memphis, you could actually see the auction block where they used to auction the slaves. Um, there's just so much uh, racist history there. And yet we felt a burden to come there. When we arrived, uh, we were a total of 26 people. I was the only piece of chocolate in the room. And uh, um, that'll hit some of you about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, but so I was, I, was, um, I was just burdened and passioned for it. There's a lot of Christian leaders in the city of Memphis who said, uh, you'll never be able to experience this. Literally, I remember uh, meeting with them at a P.F. Chang's uh, there, and they, they told us that. Well, nine years later, uh, God's been faithful and good to us. We um, were about a body of about 2,000 people, anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000. We um, about 65% white, 35% African American. We are loving on each other. When people walk into the room on Sunday morning, they uh, they get a picture of our coming eternal reality. Because John said that when he looked up into heaven, he saw people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Jesus said that when we were to pray. We are to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Translation, Jesus said that heaven ain't to be like Vegas, where what happens in heaven just stays in heaven. But if heaven is a multi-ethnic reality, then we exist to help to mimic that here on earth. And I labor to that end. So it is to that end that I'm happy to be here with you. On this great occasion, as we set aside time, in the calendar of our year annually this weekend to remember the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We all are indebted to him, especially myself as an African American man. It is because of his labors that I can sit anywhere I'd like to on a bus. I can drink out of any water fountain or use any restroom that I want in any southern city. I can sleep in any hotel that I'd like to because of him. And yet this morning, I, I want to call your attention to another passion of Dr. King. It's a little bit different uh, that unfortunately doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Dr. King was not just about racial and ethnic equality. He was also about economic equality. He lived a life of simplicity. He only took a $1 a year salary from the SCLC lived off of a $6,000 a year salary as co-pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church there in Atlanta, Georgia. He was so committed to economic justice, almost to a detriment to himself and his family, he left his wife and kids virtually nothing. When he won the Nobel Peace Prize, 
they gave him $50,000 as a part of the award. He gave every penny away. Here was a man who was passionate not just about ethnic equality, but economic equality as well. And yet his passions are biblical, and they are rooted in the scriptures. I want to divert your attention to the last sermon that Jesus Christ ever preached prior to his death on the cross. It's Matthew chapter 25. Hear now the words of Jesus beginning in verse 31. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked or naked as they say in Memphis and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, verse 37, will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? For I was hungry, you gave me no food. Thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you didn't do it to one of the least of these, You didn't do it to me, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, Father, bless both the hearing and the application of your word, that we, the children of Dr. King's dream, might follow not just in his ethnic equality steps, but in his economic equality steps, steps he learned from you. It is to that end that I'm available to you. In Christ's name, I pray, use me. Amen and amen. On October 27, 1787, a young parliamentarian sat down and wrote these words in his journal. God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. The man who wrote that was a man by the name of William Wilberforce. If you have not drunk deeply from the life of William Wilberforce, you must quickly do so. His story actually begins at the age of 21, where as he is at a party with his dear friend William Pitt, parenthetically, William Pitt would go on to become the Prime Minister of England, but here they are at the age of 21 on a whim. I don't know if they had too much champagne to drink. They turned to each other and they said, let's run for Parliament. Drawing on their vast, uh, abundant resources, they run for Parliament. William Wilberforce wins his seat in Parliament, a seat he would never lose for the rest of his tenure. Fast forward now four years, William Wilberforce is now 25 years of age. It is at the age of 25 that William Wilberforce becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. He understands and embraces the good news of Christ, that Jesus had died in his place and for his sins. And yet it is at this moment in his life that he is, he is at a fork in the road. He is experiencing a conundrum. He is saying, how can I, being a newfound follower of Jesus Christ, reconcile my faith with my vocation. After all, William Wilberforce is saying, I I for a living live off of the social, economic injustice and evil of slavery. I give leadership to a nation who, who thrives off of the social machinery of slavery. And so how can I reconcile the fact that I am a newfound follower of Jesus Christ with my vocation for giving leadership to a nation that is thriving off of the injustice, the inhumanity of slavery. And so he thought, here's what I'll do. I'll quit my job, maybe go to seminary, and maybe I'll become a pastor. But thankfully, before he did that, he went to go see his mentor, the guy who discipled him, a guy by the name of John Newton. 
John Newton. That name may sound faintly familiar to you. John Newton, for years himself, dabbled in the slave trade. He would commandeer his ship, the Greyhound, and sail down to the west coast shores of Africa, beat and bound slaves, pack them under inhumane conditions, sail them through the middle passage, and sell them into bondage. Until one day in April of 1748, John Newton was reading a book called The Imitation of Christ, written by Thomas Akempis, and the Spirit of God began to, to move in his heart and life, and he would quit his post. As, as one who was a slave trader, and he would become a pastor. And yet, if you know anything about John Newton, he struggled with the guilt and shame of his past until one day, as he described it, a beacon of light shone through. He picked up his bin, dipped it in the ink, and wrote these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It is that man that William Wilberforce goes to see, and he says to him, he shares his conundrum, Newton, you've been mentoring, how can I reconcile my newfound faith in Christ with my vocation in giving leadership to a nation that is thriving off of and perpetuating the institution of slavery? I've, I've got to quit, Newton, what do you say? And Newton would say these words, words that would change the trajectory both of Wilberforce's life and all of human history. He would say to him, it is hoped and believed, young Wilberforce, that the Lord has raised you up for the good of the nation. In other words, you can reconcile your vocation with your faith. You can redeem your vocation, not using it for evil, but using it for good. Wilberforce, we need you to see your vocation as a viable venue to advance the purposes of God. And so Christmas Eve, 1787, a 25-year-old Wilberforce stands before Parliament, and for six hours he lectures, not 25 minutes, six hours he lectures and he would say these words, my great aim is the abolition of the trade. All others are secondary. I will not rest until I have affected its cause. And they're silent like you. By the way, as a black preacher, you can talk to me. You can say, amen, preach it, brother. When you're ready for me to finish, you can say, bring it on home. Holla at me. It makes me preach faster because I know you're getting it. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. And for the next 20 years, they ridicule Wilberforce. They're saying, what do you mean you're fighting us? Don't you know that we send our kids off the money we make off the trade to private schools? We pay our mortgages. We buy our food and our clothes off of the trade. And for 20 years, he's voted down. He's assaulted. He's accosted at times within an inch of his life until finally in February of 1807, England votes to abolish the trade. 26 years later, 1833, just moments, three days before he dies, England votes to outlaw slavery 32 years ago, rippling across the Atlantic in these here United States of America. The 13th Amendment is ratified. The slaves are emancipated and set free. One of those slaves is a little known slave working the plantations in Asheville, North Carolina, owned by a family of German Reformed uh, pastors. His name is Peter Loritz. That would be my great-great-grandfather. And the reason why I am pastoring a multi-ethnic church in Memphis, Tennessee, and not picking cotton with, was because a 25-year-old white man said, I cannot relegate my faith to a few hours on Sunday mornings. I must do something. Yeah. And so in these last 13 minutes that we have together, I have no doubt that when we get to heaven, we will see not just William Wilberforce, but Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. there. They will be on the right side. Why? Because in our passage, Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you've done it unto me. But it's at this moment where we have a hermeneutical challenge, do we not? It seems as if on a cursory reading of our text that what Jesus is saying that what gets you into the kingdom is what you do for the poor. And I don't know about you, I don't know your faith tradition, but for me that disturbs me because it sounds like Jesus is preaching work salvation. 
In order to understand this, we've got some theological unraveling to do here because you need to understand that a good hermeneutics teacher would tell you that you never build and base a doctrine off of one passage of scripture. Instead, you compare your research and findings and you relate it to the whole. And one of the things that we understand when we zoom out and look at the whole tapestry of scripture from beginning to end, we understand this one foundational truth that I am not saved by works, but I am saved by grace through faith. And so I could take it to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where it said of Abraham that Abraham believed God and it was reconciled unto him. It was counted unto him as righteousness. He didn't go to synagogue first or temple first. I know they didn't have that back then, but just kind of work with me. He didn't stop the bad behavior first. He simply believed God. Immediately he is saved. He is justified. And then what's interesting, in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is justified, declared righteous. In Genesis chapter 17, he's circumcised so that even under the Old Testament paradigm, faith precedes works. I could take you to the book of Exodus where God says to the nation of Israel, one more plague is coming, but you're going to be a part of it. Here's how it's going to go down. Hang in there with me. I promise you I'm coming to your neighborhood. He says this, that this is going to be the plague of the firstborn. If you're going to get out of it, you must take the blood of a spotless lamb and put it over the doorpost of your homes. And when the death angel sees the blood of the spotless lamb, he will pass over your home. This is a foreshadowing of the new covenant where all we must do is by faith take the blood of the ultimate spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, and put it on the doorpost of our hearts and we shall be saved. Or hear the words of the apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 when he says these words that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love Romans 5, 8, and I cling to it this morning as never before because my favorite word in Romans 5, 8 is not God, is not demonstrated, is not love. It is while, while, while. That God saw us in the midst of our mess. He saw us in the midst of our internet pornography. He saw us in the midst of our slander. He saw us in the midst of our adultery. He saw us in the midst of our gossip and did not wait for us to clean up our act first. The good news of the gospel is that God sees us as is, loves us as is, accepts us as is, and receives us as is, but never leaves us as is. The good news of the gospel, and I agree with Tim Keller, is that we are more sinful than we'd like to admit, yet at the same time, we are more loved than we could ever imagine. That's tweetable. So here is the good news. So we understand that I am saved by grace through faith. So understanding that, what do we do with this text? This text is a mystery. It's a mystery. Salvation is a mystery. C.S. Lewis said it this way. C.S. Lewis said that when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised on two fronts. One, we're going to be surprised at who is not there that we knew for sure would be there. And then we're going to be surprised at who is there that we knew for sure would not be there. Salvation is a mystery, or in the words of my grandmama, Nana, she would always say it this way, everybody talking about heaven ain't going. That's Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus would say, not many who say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That friends, if all you're hanging your hat on for salvation is a prayer that you prayed at camp followed by the burning of your vanilla ice cassettes. Okay, that's a different generation. Followed by the burning of little Wayne or whatever it may be. If that's all that you're hanging your hats on. And he hasn't changed your life. See, here's what I'm saying. The way that I know that I'm saved, one word, fruit. Fruit. A changed and changing life that is not the result of the normal maturation process, but a changed and changing life that is in direct relationship to the Spirit of God, actively involved in my life. Here's what we're saying. Every believer should be able to look through the rearview mirror of their life and say, no, I am not all the way where I should be, but at the same time, I am not all the way where I once was. He is changing me. Bishop Ulmer says it this way, and I don't mind saying it to you because he said it one Sunday in front of 13,000 people. He says, when I first got saved, I used to cuss at the drop of a hat. But now since following Jesus, I don't cuss that fast anymore. (laughs) 
what is he saying? You cut me off on I-10. I might want to speak to you in sign language, but, but he's changing. <laughs> Come on, work with me. That's delayed laughter. All right, work with me, y'all. Work with me. And so, as we come to our text, I love it when theologian says that our text, watch it now, deals not with the root of salvation. It deals with the fruit of salvation. Here it is, and it's going to disturb us American Christians who live in the Disneyland of the world. Jesus Christ is saying that, he, what he's saying is one of the evidences that you know that you're saved, one of the fruit that you know the Spirit of God is in you, is that you have a heart and the actions and the benevolence towards the less fortunate. If life for you is all about saving up money to buy Madden 2012 or the next $150 pair of jeans or those expensive shoes and those $5 lattes, that stuff in and of itself is not problematic. But if you do those things and you do nothing for the poor, Jesus is saying you have no biblical grounds that you're saved. What he is connecting here is the major doct doctrines of justification and justice. If you call yourself a Christian but you do nothing for the poor, you do not understand the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ says all of us were spiritually bankrupt. All of us were headed down a one-way street for hell. And yet God in his richness, in his benevolence, he did not hoard his, his wealth. He did not hoard his abundance. But he gave and gave until it hurts by giving his only son. A greedy Christian. A greedy Christian is an oxymoron. I don't get what's so funny, by the way. Jesus says, you want to know that you're saved? It's like this. God, when he was calling the nation of Israel, in the book of Leviticus, this agrarian society, and he's setting up the economics of Israel, listen to what he says. He says, when you go to your fields, do not glean to the edges of your fields. Leave margin in your fields for the poor to come and glean. This is God's welfare strategy, by the way. It is not a system of enablement. It is a system of empowerment because look at what God is saying. If the poor want to eat, don't give them a handout. Let them come and work. I agree with some politicians who suggest that the welfare system in America has become the new slave master. It rewards laziness. Are there people who need it for a certain time? Absolutely. My mama was on welfare for a certain time. And yet, God says, leave margins in your fields. Do not max out your fields for the poor to come and glean. By the way, that's how Boaz meets a hot chick named Ruth is because he is following what God says. He leaves margins. Single men, if you want to. Anyways. <laughs> There's a hum. And so here is Boaz. I, I think the New Covenant principle is this. I think what God is saying to we American Christians is when you look at your budgets, don't max out the budgets. And I want to get to you college students while you're po, not while you're poor. You can't afford the other O and the R. While you're po. <laughs> I want to get to you now. While Vienna sausages and top ramen noodles are your best friends, I want to get to you now, listen, if you can't be generous with $10, don't kid yourself, you won't be generous with 100000 Don't kid yourself. I'll close with this. The school that I go to has a partnership with Oxford University, and so I'm on campus at Oxford University at least once a year. Whenever I go to Oxford University, if you know anything about Oxford University, they're a conglomeration of about 38 different colleges. One of those colleges is a college named Lincoln College. I always go to Lincoln College to visit because that was a college that a guy named John Wesley went to, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. John Wesley was in a small group when he was in college. His small group included his brother Charles Wesley, the famous hymn writer, and a guy by the name of George Whitfield, who only preached 18,000 times to millions of people. So if you think your small group's the bomb, I got another thing coming to you. 
John Wesley, when he was 18 or 19 years old, asked himself this question, how much do I need to live off of this year? He sat down and figured it out. He says, I need to live off of 28 pounds. John Wesley says, anything I get over 28 pounds, I will give to the poor. That first year, he made 38 pounds. 30, 30 pounds, lived off the 28 pounds, gave the other two away. John Wesley said, I like that, and I like it so much, I'll do it for the rest of my life. For the rest of his life, John Wesley says, I will only live off of 28 pounds. If you know anything about Wesley, you know that there are some years where he made a lot of money. One year, he made 1,500 pounds, but Wesley said, I'm only going to live off the 28, and I will give the other 1,472 away. John Wesley dealt with a question that most American Christians never even address. It is the question of enough. How much is enough salary? How much is enough shoes? How much is enough clothes? How much is enough? My friends, Jesus said, be on guard against greed. It's very interesting that he would pick that sin. Why does he say be on guard against greed? Why doesn't he say be on guard against immorality or lust or adultery or gossip? Because greed, unlike any other sin, is one of those things we don't know where we've crossed the line with greed until we're miles beyond it. I implore you, American Christian, follow in the footsteps of Dr. King, William Wilberforce, John Wesley. Learn to answer the question, How much is enough? How you handle money is a profound commentary on what you really believe about the gospel. Let's pray. And so, Father, I bless these, your people. I pray over them, Lord God. Yes, there was a lot that was wrong about Dr. King's life, but there was a lot that was right. I pray for myself pray for these, your people, Lord God, that even though many of them do not have financial resources, that right now your gospel would begin to blossom in there, in my heart. You would propel us to be generous people, to take the little that we have and entrust it to you. I pray, Lord God, that we would be counted among the sheep. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.